Welcome to the fourth of the five webinars that we're holding this week under the title After Strange Ways. Uh, I'm Richard Garside and I'm going to be hosting this morning's webinar. The five webinars this week mark the 30th anniversary of the 1990s Strange Ways prison protest and the official report into those protests by Lord Justice Wolfe and Sir Stephen Tumin. The report was published 30 years ago today and its legacy remains controversial. For some it represents something of a lost opportunity. Had it been implemented in full, the argument goes, a number of the problems the prison system faced in the years that followed might have been avoided. And it's certainly true that the report contained a number of important observations. On prison protests and prison rights, for example, the report argued that they, quote, cannot be dismissed as one-off events or as local disasters or a run of bad luck. They are symptomatic of a series of serious and underlying difficulties in the prison system. That said, and as Joe Sim argued very powerfully at our second webinar on Tuesday, there are also good grounds for believing that little would have changed even if the recommendations by Wolf and Tumin had been implemented in full. Now, the webinars over the past three days have explored the background to the Strange Ways prison protest and what happened during it. And then at yesterday's webinar, we discussed whether prison reform efforts over the past 30 years have been characterised more by failure than by success. Today, we continue this theme exploring various areas of injustice that have marked the prison system in the 30 years since the Strange Ways protest. During today's webinar, as previously, please do use the Q&A function to put questions to the panellists and to share your own comments and views on those questions. If you see a question from someone else who you would like to see answered, then please give it a thumbs up using the upvote function and that will increase the chances that we will come to it. If today is anything to go by, we'll get lots of questions in and we'll certainly get through as many as we possibly can. And um, if you do plan to tweet uh, during the course of the webinar, then we're encouraging people to use the hashtag after strange ways. Now we're going to be hearing from five speakers today and we're going to be disciplined on time with no one speaking for more than 10 minutes. In a bit, we'll be hearing from John Crilly. Um, John is a former prisoner, including at Strange Ways, and uh, the only prisoner indeed to have gained release from prison following the 2016 Supreme Court ruling, which found that joint enterprise laws had been misinterpreted for three decades. And John's going to be talking about the situation in prisons as he saw it. It's also worth noting that John was one of two uh, uh, pe people who'd actually been serving joint enterprise sentences on London Bridge that day, uh, tackling Usman Khan after he'd uh, launched that awful attack on Fishmongers Hall. A uh, very brave act, um, it goes without reason. Of course, the footage went around the world of the, that extraordinary, um, those extraordinary interventions. John will be followed by Patrick Williams, who will be talking about racial disproportionality within the criminal justice system. And following that, um, Caroline Willow will be talking about the child justice system. And finally, Steve Toomes, who will be talking about who doesn't get imprisoned and why. Uh, but first, I'm delighted to introduce Gloria Morrison of Jengba, Joint Enterprise Not Guilty by Association, who has been one of the leading lights uh, fighting the injustices of our joint enterprise laws. And she'll be talking about those and what needs to be do done. Uh, so Gloria, if you'd like to join us now, and we'll, um, we'll be very keen to hear what you have to say. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Centre for Crime and Justice Studies for having this event, this very important event to talk about um, our prison systems and our criminal justice system, which is um, appalling in my opinion. I'd like to start by reminding people <coughs> who don't know what joint enterprise is, that Derek Bentley was the last person hung in this country and that was using joint enterprise. He was um, a 19 year old man, boy, um, who had learning difficulties. 
who was on a burglary with a younger boy, a 17 year old, Christopher Craig. And um, they were held uh, by police officers and a police officer got shot. But because Craig was 17, he couldn't be hung because the death penalty was still in place then. But um, Bentley was. Um, I'd like to just let you remind, because I found this quite shocking that from the day the police officer PC Mills was killed to the hanging was a matter of weeks. It happened really, really fast. So prison and punishment in this country is more a policy rather than anything to do with justice. Um, so joint enterprise wasn't used much after that. Our, our data doesn't show that there was that many joint enterprise cases. So the way you can be convicted using joint enterprise is if you're with somebody else or with a group of people and they, uh, someone commits a crime that maybe you didn't know was going to happen, um, the group, the entire group can also be convicted. Now, um, one of the things Patrick will obviously talk about is how the gang narrative is used in these cases. Um, when we started our campaign in 2010, my son's best friend was convicted of a joint enterprise murder. And because he was a young black man, I kind of instinctively thought that well, this has got to be racist, because if you just put a group of black men in the dock and you don't know who's done what, you can just make assumptions that they all were in it together or they all knew what they were going to do. And that's exactly what happens. That's why juries come to the conclusion they do come to. So he's serving a life sentence for murder that he didn't commit. Um, and then I met uh, Janet Cunliffe, whose son, Jordan Cunliffe, um, is a blind 15 year old teenager who got convicted of a murder of Gary Newlove. Didn't see the victim, didn't touch the victim. But when <clears throat> Jan and I met and we talked about our cases and the other cases that I was finding, because I'd set up a group called London Against Injustice, that, um, that joint enterprise was being used quite compellingly starting from our data shows about 2005, 2006. So this goes back to the Blair government when they were talking about black on black crime, when they were talking about uh, feral Britain, when they were talking about broken Britain, but particularly this, this idea of black on black crime. It a police officer just recently saying, you know, maybe it is disproportionate that we stop and search young black youth, but there are the young black youth are killing other young black men. And that is exactly the same argument that was happening years ago. Nothing has changed. So joint enterprise is a, a, a sledgehammer for the police. It's a, um, a very easy prosecution tool to get convictions. We have an adversarial court system. So it means that it's about winning. It's not about getting justice. Joint enterprise is also common law. So it's been handed down by judges the judges um, decide, you know, it, it's common law is, means it's not it's not in statute. So our homicide, our most seen serious crimes in this country are, are um, decided by the judges, not by the government. <clears throat> we um, campaigned, we started a campaign in 2010. We got to the Justice Select Committee a couple of times. We've um, got finally to the Supreme Court in 2016, where the judges said the law had taken a wrong turn in, two, in 1984. But it hadn't taken a wrong turn here, it had taken a wrong turn in Hong Kong, because they were looking at a, a case for Chan Win Su, a Hong Kong case, and a case of Ruddock in uh, Jamaica. So again, if you look at it, it's actually, I've been saying this, it's, it's still colonialism, because you're just looking at, you're not saying we have a big problem with who we're sending to prison in this country under joint enterprise. It went wrong over there. But um, but even though they said, even though the law had been interpreted wrongly for the last three decades, which meant that the courts were relying on foresight, what people could foresee what someone else is going to do. Now, the evidence that's produced in court for foresight is that you can be in a YouTube video with some mates. You could have had a phone call with somebody um, earlier in the day you could have done the right thing and gone to the police because you saw an incident, but that can bring you into the joint enterprise. And I know this all sounds very, very far-fetched, but have a look at our website. It's not far-fetched. Jengbra are now supporting over a thousand prisoners. 
um, or serving mandatory life sentences. Now, that's the other thing people don't realise. They think you can go to prison for murder and you get, you know, you get a 10 and you serve five or you don't. Your starting point for knife crime now is 25. The starting point for gun crime is 30. Um, now, I, I'm not suggesting that, you know, someone who shoots someone that shouldn't serve a long sentence. I, should, I think, you know, there is there is arguments for um, those kind of sentences, but not for someone who hasn't actually committed that crime. And we have lots of people serving horrendously long sentences for a crime they have not committed. Um, we uh, well, thought that 2016 the Supreme Court decision was a result, but the judges put in, the Lord Chief Justice actually, put in the only cases that can prove substantial injustice can go back to the Court of Appeal. So since that time, we've gone back with cases of children, children uh, that were convicted at 13 years old and given life sentences, but that had learning at ages of eight and nine. Um, and we went back with the idea, you know, did they get a fair trial because they were treat uh, they were tried in adult court? And the Lord Chief Justice, Lord Thomas, said, yes, they had a fair trial. There was nothing wrong with their conviction, even though they're secondary parties, none of them actually committed the murder. Then we went back with a case of autism, which is Alex Henry and the Lord Chief Justice, Lord Thomas, said that um, because Alex's mum, Alex had been diagnosed with autism since he went to prison. So we took back that as fresh evidence, because how could he foresee what someone else was going to do one when he's autistic and also when it's a very fast moving, spontaneous event that lasted 58 seconds. And the Lord Chief Justice said because Alex's mum was a psychologist, she taught her son to pretend to be autistic. That's actually what he said. So that's what we're up against. Judges who've got no, no understanding of what it's like to be um, working class, to be disabled, to be um, black or ethnic minority. And this is policy. This is, you know, Jenga have long recognised its policy. We've had lots of good academic studies now saying that it targets BAME uh, communities and um, particularly the working class. And and that be, is because the judges choose that and the government choose that. So we're now in um, a situation where we're trying to bring in private members bill. We're going to launch that in March um, to get rid of the substantial injustice, because we're saying that if you've had a, you know, you've been tried in a court under the wrong law, you should have the chance to go back to either appeal your conviction, but definitely to have, you know, a retrial, a fairer um, stab at, you know, proving your innocence, because these are wrongful convictions. They're not miscarriages of justice. They're wrongful convictions because the judges accepted that the law was wrong. But um, we are up against the legal establishment, which is a huge, huge, difficult barrier uh, besides, you know, the political establishment. But um, that when Simon Baron Cohen was asked why he thought he's the lead expert on autism in this country, he was asked why he thought the Lord Thomas made that decision. He said that was a policy decision. So joint enterprise, our prison systems, our criminal justice systems are all based on policy. They're not based on trying to get a fair society, a fair, um, you know, look at who you send to prison and why you send to the prison. And why are we are the only country in Europe that sends children to prison for life, nowhere else in Europe have joint enterprise and nowhere else in Europe would ch send children to prison for life. They need help if a child has gone down a path that's very wrong. Look in Norway, they, they, they help them, they don't send them to prison and what sort of child are you going to get after 15, 20 years of prison life? So um, I'll leave it there Richard if that's okay, um, I think I've done 10 minutes but um, do uh, you know look please support Jenga because we're a very important campaign made up of completely grassroots of families who've got loved ones in prison and won't, won't give up, won't give up on our, our loved ones that are serving life sentences. Thank you very much Gloria. Um, just stay with us for a second. Um, there's a question that's, that's come in. Um, why is it only working class and black kids who get done under joint enterprise? Why don't the rich and powerful get prosecuted for abuse of power, corruption and fraud? And I kind of guess you've sort of sort of answered that question in your presentation to a degree but I don't know if you have any kind of thoughts on that and just in more broadly I suppose the what feels like a very kind of unequal playing field uh, you know for 
for people in society, depending on the types of crime they've committed, but more importantly, kind of where they kind of are situated in the social uh, hierarchy. Mm. Yeah, it is. It is. And um, it's, it's families get very, very frustrated in terms of sentencing when you see that, you know, there was that boy who got stabbed by two other boys and they got acquitted. Whereas we've got people who weren't even at the scene of a crime who are serving very long sentences. Um, it's it's a, it's an anomaly, you know. It, it doesn't really make sense why. I, the only way I can kind of sum it up is I, one of the first times I got interviewed by Radio Four to do. Um, I, I was trying to talk to this researcher about joint enterprise, and it's a long time ago. And I got really frustrated because people just didn't understand it. They just didn't understand how easy it is to be convicted under joint enterprise. And I said to the researcher, "Look, why is it if you've got four white kids on an estate, or walking down the road in?" Oxford or somewhere, you know, you're not going to call them a gang, but you've got four white black kids on my West London estate and they're a gang. And she said, because the white kids aren't trying to stab one another. Now, that's a that's an intelligent researcher's question. And it's that attitude. It's that kind of idea that they are something other. You know, there is another other that's the working class and, and the Bane communities. Are, are, we are you know, because we're poor, we have to kind of have feral activities or you know, criminal activities. Whereas the very rich and powerful and the actual gangs, the proper gangs that are, you know, are importing cocaine are, you know, they are somehow untouchable, even though the police probably know who they are. But they don't go for them. They go for the for the weakest link. And that, that's been time immemorial. I mean, I think, you know, when we when we look back at prison, the penal reform, there has been no reform. In fact, I was saying this the other day, it, you know, it probably would have been better to be sent to Australia because they haven't got COVID over there at the moment, have they? So, you know, like it, it, what we do to our prisoners and prisons, and there was another death in Berwyn yesterday, and no one's reporting on what's going on in prisons right now and the fact that they have had no contact with their families for nearly a year. <laughs> Sorry, I've gone off the point a little bit there about, you know, I mean, we used to say this, the MPs expenses, they all knew what they were doing. That was, wasn't that a joint enterprise? The tax evasion, that's, isn't that a joint enterprise when everybody knows how they are avoiding tax? You know, it's pick and choose. It's, it's a way of actually targeting certain communities because the police choose to, and it is the police who choose to. Um, and no one is held accountable for it, even though there's been reform in 2016 we're still getting joint enterprise cases they're still using joint enterprise they think it, that people thought it went away because they started trying to use different language like parasitic accessorial liability or conditional intent that's what lady halet said about a girl who was looking for her shoes in a car park laura mitchell it was conditional intent so they're trying to take away the, the language because if people put in joint enterprise they find us they find us they find a campaign yeah. yeah. No, well, thank you. That's really um, important. There's a question here from, um, or, or a statement from Cable saying, do they not understand glory or do they not want to understand? Well, I mean, you're very clear, I think, and very clearly setting up your position. So it's difficult not to conclude that people don't want to understand or would rather move on. Um, but I think what we should do at this point is, um, is say thank you very much. And yes, um, Jengba are an excellent organisation. So uh, you know, if you feel like making them a donation, please do. They do really outstanding work and really on a shoestring, actually. Uh, and they're a very admirable group of people. So please do consider supporting Jenga and its work. Thank you, Richard. Right, let's move on. So um, our next speaker is uh, is John Crilly. Um, John, if you'd like to to unmute and uh, and get your video going, lovely. Um, John, as I, as I indicated, the only prisoner uh, to have successfully gained release. I would say freedom is probably too strong because um, actually once you're released from prison, one is often still under a lot of supervision. So but at least gained release from prison. Well done on that. But uh, extraordinary situation that you're the only prisoner to have managed to do that four years, four years plus after the Supreme Court um, ruling. So, John, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm the only person. What he's been released since the change in the law, which is just disgraceful. But um, I'm here to talk about strange ways, um, pre riot, post riot. I have experienced it both on both sides. Um, I went to strange ways in 1987 
Um, I was only 15. I was on crutches as well. And um, I've been being ragged off and shot by the police. Um, yeah, so I first went straight into that 15 on crutches and they put me on the force in with uh, some big grown man. Um, Reception itself was an experience back then. You used to go in, you used to use old measurements to measure your, but the, the, if you didn't like it, you just whack you on the head of it. It was just all, um, as soon as you walk through the door, it was just bully tactics. The, um, the prison system back then as a whole, mainly strange ways we're talking about, but as a whole, it's just a lot of itself. Um, behind the, their walls, they, they, they have no accountability to anybody. Especially back before Strange Ways, but um, yeah, so the conditions in Strange Ways back then, obviously, you must have seen videos and that are all true. It was um, slopping out, there'd be shit running down the landings, um, no electric, no nothing, shower once a week, and the cells would be rotten, decaying, and that was back then. Um, yeah, being in there at 15 was a bit of a, an experience for me, I guess, I don't know. I knew, I seem to know a lot of people off my estate in there, a lot of older men, but uh, still wasn't nice. Um, if, I guess if it wasn't for my mother looking after me, visiting me, uh, it would have been it would have been a totally different experience. But yeah, the officers back then just used to, if you had any disagreements, there was no uh, complaints system, no um, board of visitors back then. So it was just basically you and them. And uh, obviously, they're going to win every time. The, yeah, I'm just thinking about to say, I don't know. Just like the processes back then, um, you just went in and you done your time. There was no um, IP, IEP system or anything like that. You just went in, done your time, come home, and that was it. But, um, the riots. I got out of there two weeks before the riots, thankfully, but um, it wasn't a surprise to anybody. The officers knew it was coming. Um, he was talking about it two weeks before when I was in there. Um, so they knew it was coming, but they just thought, like all the other times, they would just take control, just beat us down. And um, I guess you read what you saw in it and um, yeah, I don't think it's going to be long until something else goes up again. We've had Birmingham since. It's just a little indicator of, of things haven't changed. Um, I don't really know what to tell you about. What else I can tell you about Strange Ways that you just don't know. Um, visits and stuff. They take, they, take, they take it out on your family as well, don't they? They just... They just evil people they still seem to be it's just a culture in there of um i heard them talking about a staff culture in there and and it's so true um they think they're untouchable i was just going around in circles so i'm going to move on to change ways after the riot when the riot was going on first we just slow down there it was, it was like um uh, yeah dog, dog vans out there it was like a big um carnival or something it was nuts but, and it was just crazy how, how many people supported the lads. A good friend of mine was in there at 15. I know he was 15 like me, but um, he was in there when the riot went off. He ended up on the roof till the last three people, I think, and ended up getting, I think it was eight years he got. But yeah, so it's just a, just a, a, a um, it's a fair example of how it, once you get in the criminal justice system, you're just gonna, you're never getting out of it. You just one way or another, you're gonna get embroiled in us and them. Just it's obviously the staff, the government against you, the lads in your little world, in it. So, so I think even once you go in there, there's nothing to stop you staying in there. I went back in there after the riots in a brand new prison. It was. Um, electric you could even buy your own tellies back then if you didn't keep your tellies but you could have if you had your family you could have tellies computer games and it was really strange big visiting all and officers were just really really nice they cut they were bending over backwards to help you um 
but we we none of us uh, fell for it. It was it didn't take him long to uh, slowly turn back into the the animals he was before it. Um, but this time now, there have been some changes since the Wolf Report. Um, I guess I they're all superficial though. Um, the IEP system or the visitors. Um, the IEP system is just a joke. It's just another way to, and that's what they do now. They, 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 they still beat you up, still kick shit out of you, and still get away with it. But they tend to do more like underhand ways now. Like they'll they'll mess your parole up, they'll put a bad report in or some somewhere. That's all they need to do. IEP EP system. Oh yeah. They, the system has changed. Um, I don't know what's better about it. I, I would prefer to go back to how it was. Crazy enough. I just go in, do my jail, and come out. No one's. You knew where you stood back then. Now, office could be talking to dead nights and it'll, it'll go away and write something in your, in your whatever it is, your little record you have in prison. And that will, that will ruin your life. I don't see much has changed. Um, Talking a lot about um, rehabilitation and family family um, contacts and that that's just that has never been given the attention it needs um, the support it needs. When families come up to visit, this is what I'm saying. The, the, the prison officers think the families are uh, offenders as well and just treat them like that. And it's a lot of families just then don't want to visit. Or uh, I don't know, but nothing's changed. It's just all. Got like just like the prisons, just licks the paint on it and um, cover up the cracks. But yeah, they still beat you up. They still ruin your proper air. They're still doing everything they used to do. Um, now they just have to be a bit more careful with paperwork, I guess. Um, I don't know if there's anything more specific, Richard, you want me to cover. I did have loads in my head, but it's just you know what? It's just pretty simple, isn't it? Three impulse strange ways and nothing has changed. It's just a. Um, Thank you, John. And, and, and I think nothing's changed because of the, the perception of the of society, and 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 I, and I think that's um, definitely media led, and we need to tackle anything. We ta need to tackle media and um, perspectives on prisoners. Thank, thank you, John. I mean, that's really, um, I mean, I, it's, it was so interesting just hearing you talking about your your recollections as a 15 year old in strange ways. And it made me, earlier in the week, we were watching um, some of the footage from Rex Bloomstein's documentary, and it just made me think, goodness, you know, just that was a few years, you were there a few years. Well, well, when I went in the cell, it's, it's, it's funny now when I look back, but it was, it was horrendous. When I went in the cell, after a couple of hours, this guy's got his own. Um, Hands down, his pants and his and he's squeezing it, and he pulls a crab out. He's got guys got crabs, and he's showing me these fucking. Yeah, they just so you're mixing cons with big hairy ass men, and and then that's still going on today, and that's another issue that needs sorting out. Um, kids shouldn't even be in jail. Prison needs to do, be done away with. I think the important about getting done away with prisons is you need to catch kids when the kids get like you know, Glory was saying, Norway. Do it's amazing that they look after the kids. They don't let them forget what they've done, but they let them learn from it, educate them, and make them uh, good contributing members of society, which is what we're, we're totally lacking. It's just lock them up. Public don't mind, so why should we? Do you know what I mean? So. You also said, and I was really struck by um, something you said, um, amongst the many things you said that struck me, uh, you just said, well, actually, in some ways, I mean, notwithstanding that horrendous story you just said about, you know, being in strangers at 15, in some ways that kind of was better than now in relation to feeling you just do your yeah, you, know, you know what it is? I, I've, I've talked a bit about the prison, the prison office culture, but the, 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 the lads back then, there, there was no, there was, I remember talk vaguely of heroin. It was the odd one or two, but there was a big stigma around it. Everyone was just smoking weed. The officers seemed to just let them get on with it, and 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 lads had a bit about them. They was all the, the back each other up back then. Obviously, the riot people had 
had some, uh, I know it's criminally minded, but there's still some sort of moral code there. Now with the IUP, the telly, once that telly drops outside the cell door, things change, they, they split all the lads up, so the lads don't want to lose the telly now, so they're not going to say no about you giving him a slap. Where in the past they would have gone, yeah, what are you doing? Maybe signed a statement. No, no, I'm not going to lose my telly. I'm not going to lose my IP. So they divide and conquer. Yeah. And there's a question here from um, Leslie Jane Freeman. And um, she just, I think, struck by, you know, it must have been a kind of a really lasting impact for you of being in, in strange ways at such a young age. And I mean, you should be. You've, you've well, this, this is what I'm saying, Richard. I, I, I was in Stranger at 15. I got expelled at 13. I was out walking the streets. Um, I had an amazing upbringing. I was a spoiled little brat, so nothing sent me wrong then. It's just I got expelled. Um, I couldn't get in any other skills. Well, I got in other skills, just fighting straight away, the new kid and all that. So I was just left walking around the streets with no interventions to come in to help me. That's what I'm saying. If you come and intervened in my life back then, I used to love school. I adored school. I was devastated when it kicked me out. You intervene at my life then properly. You maybe could have stopped all the rest of it. Maybe. And just well, thank you. Thank you. Just one, maybe one other quick question, maybe if you think about it. It's from Rebecca Hollows. And she says, Thank you so much for sharing your experiences, John. And I suspect she speaks for everyone here, actually. Um, I agree on the importance of media influencing attitudes towards prisoners. How do you think the media portrayal has changed since the riots? Has it got even worse? I mean, I suppose portrayal of prisoners. Well, definitely the, the, the media just use that to show that we're all savages in it, like we're all barbarians or something, we're just lunatics ripping up the place without seeing that, like, everything that went on that had been done to us for years and years. So. Yeah, I think the media just build off that, don't they? The media just jump on anything they can to sell papers and to stigmatise Britain's kids. Like, obviously, the big ones, the James Bolger case, that's changed criminal age responsibility and all sorts of madness just because of one-off event. People just, media just jump in and blow everything out of proportion. Not that I wasn't a, an horrific crime, but there were still 10-year-old kids Kids, that's what everyone's missing. The kids, man. Don't hear. Well, thank, thank you so much, John. I think that was a really, you know, extraordinary and insightful. Um, I seem to got lost okay. when I had to speak on my own for ten minutes and better get questions. It's, it's really difficult, actually, because you're kind of you're just talking to your computer and you're thinking, there, thinking, is there anybody there? Oh, yeah, yeah. Really There's not so, even an audience. Yes, yeah, oh yeah. Right. It's a very weird experience, isn't it? Um, so, but you did really, really well, and I think uh, I think made some fantastic points. Uh, and I know we'll want to come back to a number of those during the the Q and A session. But what I'd like to do at this stage is say thank you very much. Um, stay with us, of course, and we'll come back to to, to okay. the other questions. So, thank you. Um, right. Um, well, that was amazing. Um, thank you very much, John. Um, Okay, our next speaker is Patrick Williams, and Patrick's going to be talking about racial disproportionalities, as it's maybe sometimes like euphemistically called racism, is, that, is another term for it, uh, within the criminal justice system. So, uh, Patrick, if you'd like to join us now, and um, it's good to see you, and uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm um, just going to share some slides. And I just want to open by um, firstly saying thank you to the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies um, and for the invitation to speak at this really important event. Um, I guess what I've been asked and tasked to speak to is, I think you quite rightly say, Richard, this notion of disproportionality or increasing the notions of ethnic disparity within the criminal justice system of England and Wales. Um, however, what I will also do is begin to move towards a consideration of responses to what I see as a racialization of crime. Um, so that will also become a feature of this presentation. However, from the outset, um, I just want to be clear about a couple of things. 
I think for me, it's implausible to begin to think about prisons and the wider criminal justice system across England and Wales without an acknowledgement of the harmful effects of this upon minoritised groups and communities. What we know today is that Black, Asian and minority ethnic people on average are 10 times more likely to be stopped and searched by the police than their white counterparts. What we know is that this figure of being over-policed increases in particular parts of the country, sometimes up to 20 times more likely to be stopped and searched. What we now know is that we, minoritised people, are at greater risk of being arrested by the police, at greater risk of being charged, and more likely to receive those more punitive sentences and disposals when we enter the court arena. That's just to echo what Gloria has just spoken to earlier about the increasing likelihood of black and brown young people and also working class young people to be subjected to the more harmful effects of the criminal justice system. I guess when we begin to look at these numbers in relation to those who are confined within the youth offender institutions, what we now know is that minoritised young people, black and brown young children and young people, now represent over half of the population within those institutions. For me, this marks one of those tragedies. We now have a ready-made cohort of young black and brown people awaiting to transition to the adult prison estate. Now, for over 20 years, I've been involved in research and studies with the aims of trying to almost surface what the drivers of this racial disproportionality, disparity is. I've also sought to try and challenge some of those mainstream explanations for what drives racial disparity. Those explanations that tend to focus on educational attainment or the family or single parent fathers. For me, these are all partial and almost weak associations or explanations for racial disparity. Earlier, I spoke about stop and search. And for me, to be stopped and searched is not a random encounter. It is a deliberate police response to the racialized view of the crime problem. I also want to mark this moment as representing 40 years. I think it's this year, it will be 40 years since the uprisings that took place in Manchester, some three miles from Strange Race Prison, an event which was triggered by oppressive policing practices up and down this country. A moment which has been captured by the Manchester band, Harlem Spirits, entitled, Them Are Sus in the Muss. I guess for me, therefore, in beginning to think through this question of racial disparity or disproportionality or differential treatment within the criminal justice system, I want to tease out maybe three key points. I want to argue that the lyrics to the song, Them Are Sus in the Muss, represent that minorities, minoritized communities are still viewed with suspicion. The policing of minority ethnic communities is driven by a presumption of criminality. What we now know is that these suspicions have now almost been hardwired into systems whereby black and brown communities are presented as risk to be managed. We are perceived as being risky. And in speaking to some of the individuals as part of my research, what we find is that they begin to acknowledge and recognize very quickly their risk status. So when I was speaking to Paul, Paul says I was high risk, but then I was a risk. I was cat A for seven and a half years. I should never have been cat A for seven and a half years. I went into prison in 1996. In 1999, I turned to an adult. That's when I should have been put off cat A, but they kept me on for another four years. That doesn't make sense. Everybody's coming in after me for worse crimes and they're coming off cat A, leaving me scratching my head thinking, what am I doing wrong? That sense that he has to try and make sense of what is he doing wrong? I'm still on cat A. I go to Franklin, cat A. It wasn't because I was from my side. It wasn't because of my offence. It was because the police gun and gang unit and their involvement was keeping me cat A. It's a hard thing risk, 
Because if you had an offence that's knife related and then afterwards you're caught carrying a knife, yeah, that is risk because there is something that could happen. I'm no risk. I was always considered myself low risk inside or outside. I guess for Paul, what he begins to speak to and recognises is how that Chris almost becomes embodied, how black and brown folks increasingly are presented with these problems. And essentially this moves us to begin to think about the features of criminalisation and the processes by which groups become criminalised. Thinking about the work of Jemba and Gloria and Jan, what we begin to see is the emergence of these discourses, for example, notions of the gang or notions of the Muslim extremist, which are used as a way of signifying the groups and communities who are subject to surveillance. But what we know for a fact is that to be in a gang is not a criminal offence. To listen to grime, grime or drill music is not a criminal offence. To make hand signs or to have friends who may have been in prison or been on probation is not an offence. But increasingly what we find is that those individuals who we associate within those communities or with those individuals are increasingly at risk of convictions for offences they have not committed. But these individuals also will be subjected to ongoing surveillance, whether inside of the prison or outside of the prison. And for me, it's really interesting to begin to think about this notion of transcarceration, how irrespective of where individuals are, the surveilling lens is trained upon those black and brown communities. So for Paul, when he's released from custody, he said, there's one police officer, he spotted me. He was at an event and that was it. He was on his radio to all the other police officers. He's telling them, oh, that's him, I can see him. I'm not a risk outside of prison. If I was a risk outside, I'd still be inside. Just leave me alone to live my life. You robbed me of 18 years. I ain't gonna get them back. Just leave me alone. There's something really profound in that moment where Paul just wants to be left alone. But the lens and the discourse and the associations and presumptions of criminality demand that the police and law enforcement agencies will continue to monitor and surveil these individuals. I guess for me, therefore, what becomes really important is to acknowledge and recognise that what drives disparity is racism and the racialization of crime. The disproportionality that we speak of is driven by the perceptions of black and brown people as criminal. These are not new tropes. These are the same tropes that lead to the harmful encounters that black and brown people have with the police. In essence, it's about how we begin to protect the white public from those who are perceived as being dangerous. And what we begin to see are a series of arrangements, multi-agency setups, what WAC has to fail would increasingly talk about as punishing partnerships, partnerships that involve the police and youth offending services, probation, the local authority, prisons, the job centre, voluntary organisations. For Gary, the thing is what pisses me off is that they have the power to do extra stuff and their power derives from intelligence. You can ask them, what's the intelligence? They say they're not allowed to tell you. We're not allowed to tell you. Now your intelligence is not a proven piece of information. Intelligence that you might have got from a grass. You might have got it from someone that just dislikes other people. They're chatting shit. You could have got it from anywhere. It's not proven in court. So why is it then allowing you the powers to come to oppress me? You know what I mean? You're pressing me with power that you shouldn't even have. This power and this notion of oppression and the sharing of intelligence is increasingly come to the fore and becoming hardwired in the criminal justice system of England and Wales. For me, it's really important to acknowledge and to re reflect upon the notion of, for example, risk allocation tools or risk categorization tools. This has been piloted in prisons recently, which draws upon the intelligence system within the community and held by the police to determine what should be the category, the class category of people who go into prisons. And what early pilots of these tools, these technological devices have begun to show is that for black individuals, they were up risk in relation to their categorization in prison. And for white individuals, they were down risk. 
Now, this was just a pilot and it involved just a small number of individuals. But in essence, we're beginning to see these intelligence driven devices and tech being used as a way of inferring risk. My concern, therefore, is that increasingly, rather than responding to questions of disparity, we will increasingly hardwire discrimination into the system which makes it more and more difficult for the likes of Gary and Paul to make sense of their negative experiences. I just want to wrap up with the final words of um, Dave, because Dave also was an individual who I spoke to about his experiences of being in prison and serving a long-term uh, custodial sentence. And I remember we were talking about the notion of prisons and discrimination and racism in prisons. And he was like, people are like prison staff are super racist. He says they are to a degree, but what it is is that whites are favourites and that's how it is. We can't do half the stuff that these white guys are doing because you're a black guy or you're an Asian guy. There'll be white guys on the wing and everyone will be safe. Everyone gets along with each other. There's no racial divide on the wing. But even the white guys were coming up to us and saying, I don't know how you guys put up with this shit. But what it is, is that you'll never get away with what the white guys are getting away with in prison. You get away with decent amounts, but not the same amount as these white guys. Some of these guys are running wings. Favoritism, always. So you're basically living as a second-class citizen. And what I want to finalise and end here with is that notion of a second-class citizen within a prison or within the community is what fuels or is what's driven by that sense of suspiciousness, that sense of riskiness. And in essence, in order to understand racial disparity and disproportionality, it's about recognizing how the state categorizes and punishes those individuals who are deemed as outsiders and who are deemed as othered. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. That was that was really, really good and really, I think, really important to um, kind of set of critiques and observations. Uh, someone in the chat earlier said, oh, I'm looking forward to hearing um, Patrick. Um, he'll, he'll relate the reality of this really well. So, and I think you did that very well indeed. So thank you. Um, a quick question for you. We're, we're slightly overrunning now, but I think it'd be good to just get your immediate thoughts on this. There's a question for you here. Um, is there evidence to suggest that black and brown prisoners serve longer periods on indeterminate sentences over the minimum term or tariff or expiry date? Uh, so a quick, quick thought from that, and then we'll move on to Caroline. Yeah. Um, there's probably going to be people on the panel who are better placed to really quickly respond to that question. However, um, following the work we did, uh, Becky Clark and myself did with um, Jemba, what was clearly evident is that um, black and brown people and minority ethnic people in general were serving lengthier custodial sentences uh, than their white counterparts. Uh, this was some similarly... Um, picked up in a LAMI review as well, which again demonstrated that prisoners are younger, but also serving more lengthy custodial sentences. So certainly some evidence to support um, that argument. There's some, I mean, we can go back to Gloria and Gloria can speak to some of the horrendous sentences that, that have been handed down to young people for offences that they've not committed. And I guess essentially what we're beginning to see is the prison as a site of trying to manage and regulate those individuals who are politically and media wise presented as problems. Um, I guess there's an additional point I wanted to make here. And it's that tension between notions of riskiness and needs assessment. So a piece of work I've done recently has pointed towards what we're finding is that practitioners either within the youth justice sector or practitioners who are in prisons within probation are invariably using prison as a, a device, as a way of trying to protect young people as well, which I find increasingly bizarre and extremely perverse. So what we know is that young people are presented as maybe at risk of violence. And I know Gloria just made reference earlier to the notion of black and black violence, which I always find a really problematic term, increasingly given we don't really speak about white and white violence, which is just as prevalent. But in, in essence, what we begin to see is that risk assessment tools around notions of safeguarding and protecting young people invariably inc increase their risk, which therefore results in these young people being remanded into custody. 
And this was evidence, irrespective of offence, background, circumstances, we're seeing that remand and imprisonment is being used as a, a place of safety in inverted commas. Now, when we speak to individuals about their experiences of being in these spaces, they're extremely violent, I'm echoing Joel Sims' word, extremely violent and dangerous places. The prison is being used as a site, as a reflection of the failings of the, um, I would argue, the structures within the community. The absence of those resources and spaces to protect young people result in those individuals being referred or remanded into custody as a way of protecting those young people. So, um, yeah, I think that's an important point thank to make. You. No, thank you very much, Patrick. That's really good. And it's actually really uh, tees up very nicely our next speaker, um, Caroline, who's going to be talking about the targeting of, of children and young people by the justice system. So thank you very much, Patrick. Um, Caroline, if you'd like to join us, um, you're very welcome. And uh, we look forward very much to what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, I'm really pleased to have this slot to um, speak about children and the abuse that is child imprisonment. The suffragettes, which fought for the franchise for women, used the slogan, deeds, not words, meaning that actions speak louder than words. But I want to start today by reflecting on the words we hear and have heard around child prisons. Let's start with a word used by a G4S senior manager of Rainsbrook Secure Training Centre during a visit I made there as part of the Carlisle inquiry into the use of segregation, uh, strip searching and restraint on children. He, in, in quite a passing way, um, used the term sterile area. I had a hunch as to what he meant, but I asked him, what does sterile area mean? And he told me that, that those were the parts of the prison where children couldn't go, sterile area. How about safe cell and safe clothing? Words which Yvonne Scholes heard about her desperately ill and vulnerable 16 year old boy, Joseph who was able to hang himself nine days after being admitted to a prison in 2002. Joseph's mother told me, they should have said, Yvonne, he's in a cell, he's stripped naked, he's got a horse blanket like garment on, fastened with Velcro. It's filthy and squalid. I mean, the window's about two or three inches deep in dirt between the pane and the bars and the outer pane. He's on a concrete plinth with a thin plastic mat. That would have been the truth. But instead I was told he would come to no harm. He's in a safe cell, he's in safe clothing. What about distraction techniques? The term devised by the Home Office to describe three types of deliberate, serious infliction of pain on children as young as 12. Techniques approved for the newest form of child prison, the Secure Training Centre, uh, with the first of which opened in 1998. The nose distraction, which involved a karate chop to the base of the nose working upwards. The rib distraction, where fingers would be pierced into the side of a child's rib. And the thumb distraction, where a child's thumb was deliberately yanked back. Then there's safety scissors, the scissors that can be used to cut off children's clothes when they have refused to surrender to a strip search. Full search is another form of words which avoids telling the truth of what's done to children. One girl in a secure training centre explained, when I had my first full search I was 14. It was horrible as I have been sexually abused and I didn't feel comfortable showing my body as this brought back memories. They told me if I didn't take my clothes off, they would do it when they got permission. That's doing it with force. Think about adjudication, the prison service's own justice system where punishments are called awards. Then there was the word OXO, which officers were taught to shout out during restraint training if they couldn't breathe. No such relief was given to children. 
You'll recall that Gareth Myatt, aged 15 and weighing just six and a half stone and standing less than five feet tall, told officers he couldn't breathe and was told if you can speak, you can breathe. Gareth died following restraint um, and I don't think it's any coincidence uh, that he was a mixed race child. That was in 2004. In this time of global pandemic, new, new terminology has arisen. We now have reverse cohort units where prisoners are isolated for 14 days before being able to join the general prison population. In December, prison inspectors found that children entering Rainsbrook Secure Training Centre had been put into the reverse cohort unit for 14 days, only being out of, allowed out of their cells for 30 minutes in every 24 hours. In July last year, prison inspectors found that the majority of children in Feltham and Warrington young offender institutions had been kept in their cells for 22 hours a day for 15 weeks. If you're finding that hard to compute as an adult, then think about the long summer holidays we had. That was six weeks. So we're looking at two and a half times our school summer holidays being locked in a tiny room for 22 hours a day. Of course, children themselves construct their own language too. John talked earlier about how he co coped as a 15 year old child in strange ways because his mum visited him. That reminded me of Nick Hardwick, the former chief inspector of prisons, recounting the term used by boys who sit in a prison waiting area whose visitors don't turn up. I've witnessed this myself, isn't a child in, in prison. After a while, when, when children are sat there, boys are sat there, um, when their visitors haven't turned up, uh, the officers indicate to them, they give them the nod that they have to stand up and walk back to the main prison and to their cells. And children call this the walk of shame. Then within children's social care, which is my background, we have the terminology secure welfare bed. To differentiate the beds that children are put into for punishment. I've not myself heard or seen in writing the term secure punishment bed, but that's what incarcer incarceration in young offender institutions and secure training centres are for children, of course. 1990 is also a special anniversary within the children's social work arena. Pindown was named in 1990 following a, a child abuse inquiry. This is the a report uh, from that inquiry. It was conducted by a national childcare expert and a barrister. And they reported that it contained the worst elements of institutional control. Children were made to have baths on admission, to wear special clothing, there was a strict routine, segregation, isolation, humiliation and inappropriate bedtimes. They said the regime was based on the principle that we were establishing control. That's why it was permitted. The impact on the children was, in our view, likely to be wholly negative and was, was so in that the regime imposed was fundamentally dependent on elements of isolation, humiliation and confrontation. That's the words of the inquiry authors. And they went on to say, pin down, in our view, falls decisively outside anything that could properly be considered as good childcare practice. It was in all its manifestations intrinsically unethical, unprofessional and unacceptable. Having started my career in the 1980s as a child protection social worker, this is what drives me on. It cannot stand that the state, 
and all its manifestations has decided at the highest level that one group of children, children in care, cannot ever again be subject to deliberate humiliation, isolation, degradation, yet permit another group of children to be subject to the very same things. And in December 2016, there was what we might call a breakthrough in that the Ministry of Justice committed to phasing out young offender institutions and secure training centres for children, replacing them with secure schools, and that's a separate discussion. But the argument has been won that child prisons are not fit for purpose, they cannot remain. Some of you may, may have seen the news this week that the motto of the NASA lab working on the Perseverance rover, which landed on Mars, um, was called Dare Mighty Things. And the full quote comes from Theodore Roosevelt in 1899. And he said, far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to take rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they live in the grey twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. And that's my summing up today, is that we have to stay sharply focused on the abuse that is deliberately designed inflicted and experienced by children in prison and that it cannot stand and the mighty thing is to close down these prisons and we have a government that has committed to closing them down and we it is our obligation both within those of us that work within the system those that work around the system and those who are out of the system to keep hold them to that commitment and to demand a national closure program for child prisons. The latest statistics show that there was 535 children in custody in October. Children who were in custody because they'd been remanded or sentenced. 535, I refuse to believe that as a society, we cannot work out how to treat 535 children with care, humanity, respect and decency. As Patrick said, every second cell, you walk along a London, every second cell of child prisons are occupied by children from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. That cannot go on. More than half of children detained in prisons have been in care. Over a quarter are disabled and more than a third have health problems. But actually imprisonment is wrong for all children, no matter what their background and their circumstances. And just to end, I want us to think about what kind of lives are we wanting children who are currently in prison to live? What conduct, what behaviour are we looking for from them? And I'd say we want children to treat others with kindness, to be thoughtful, to be respectful, to be reliable and to be fair. And for themselves, I'd say we want children to feel happy, to feel safe, to feel connected, fulfilled, to have a purpose both as children and for the future and for them to feel that they're good and honest people. And I'd say if this is what we want, you, you'll have different, different lists. But if this is more or less what we want, our children, uh, their lives to look like and for, for their conduct and their behaviour and for our children to feel that we need to make it happen. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Caroline. And I was really struck by that figure of 535 um, in custody, which is obviously significantly less than it was a decade ago, but it's still far too many. And um, it's actually fewer than one child per parliamentary constituency, you know. And I would imagine that if most MPs were asked, could you imagine just one child in your constituency currently not in prison? They wouldn't have any difficulty imagining that. So it seems to me that it's an argument that is winnable. Uh, very, very quickly, and then we must move on. Uh, there's a question here from um, Vic Fernandez for you. Do you think under 21 offenders should be in a secure unit instead of prison? I can't think I maybe know what you might say, but do you want to offer a very quick reflection on that and then we'll move on to Steve? Yeah. Um, well, the children's social care arrangements has over the decades increased the age, recognising people's vulnerability, that the growth of human beings goes right into the, the, the most accelerated growth of human beings. Obviously, we grow throughout our lives. Um, in children's social care, it goes to 25. Um, I, I, I would say to policymakers and to parliamentarians and government, look for your most humane, your most evidence-based policy, and then try and make that better. Don't, don't replicate the worst, um, which is in the penal system. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Uh, right, before we move on to Steve, just a quick reminder, we, we're getting quite a lot of questions coming through the Q&A. Um, do keep them coming in, we'll answer as many as we can. Uh, but it gives me a great pleasure now to introduce uh, Steve Toome, who's popped up on the screen. Uh, Steve, you're most welcome, and uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, so I just want to want to begin by with these two quotations, which I hope you can see on the screen here. Um, I'm not going to talk through them, but both of those uh, on the, both those quotations indicate that we can't understand the crisis of prisons, of over imprisonment imprisonment of criminal justice, of definitions of crime in general, without thinking simultaneously about the crises of under enforcement when it comes to the crimes of the powerful. So questions like who or what is not imprisoned, who or what doesn't count either formally in law or practically by enforcement as criminals, and to what extent is there a relationship between crime and harm? What are the relationships with relationships in those offences marked out by criminal law and those actions and omissions? which cause large scale routine social harm, but operate beyond the radar of the law and the criminal justice system. And, and these considerations for me, raise wider questions of justice, accountability and social protection. And they put the prison in context. And that's what I want to do today a bit. Um, and I want to do that by speaking briefly about some aspects of crimes that are powerful. Now in the same year as the, as the protest at Strangeways 1990, uh, myself, along with a friend, colleague and, and mentor of mine, Frank Pierce, we got involved in an academic discussion in the pages of, uh, of the British Journal of Criminology. It was a kind of academic spat, really. And it involved Frank and I writing two pieces and having two responses from a guy called Keith Hawkins. And Keith Hawkins was a significant figure because he was head of, the head of a centre of social legal studies at Oxford University, which was the key source of serious statements of hegemonic knowledge around how to deal with powerful offenders, corporations and, and, and uh, powerful white collar offenders. Uh, so the focus of the debate was on corporate crime, regulation and sanctions. And Keith Hawkins and his colleagues then, and they still do argue, and they still are the dominant voice in this area, they argued that corporate crimes, in fact, they were talking specifically about safety crimes, violations of the law, which end up with workers being killed or, 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 or killed through fatal injury or through occupational disease. They argued, that, they argued that safety and corporate crimes weren't real crimes. And they weren't real crimes for a series of reasons, partly because they lacked what they state that they lacked mens rea, they lacked intention, they lacked a guilty mind. That meant they were morally problematic as crimes. And these crimes by powerful corporations and individuals also worked, but they were marginal side effects of what was essentially socially useful and socially necessary economic activity. So for these reasons, these kinds of crimes did, did, did required a particular response, particular kind of social response. They required compliance oriented enforcement. And that meant that regulators should respond to them by seeking to bring corporations into line with the law in the future. So it didn't violate the law again, didn't kill or injure workers again, didn't make workers ill again, um, as opposed to what they call punitive forms of enforcement which were seeking to punish a past wrong, seeking to punish a corporation for killing, injuring, 
making ill a worker. And Frank and I uh, were arguing that there should be more punitive modes of enforcement um, directed against powerful offenders, corporations and individuals. And we contested many of the claims of Hawkins across these uh, pieces. And we argued, in fact, that, that you know, Hawkins's, Hawkins's claims about lacking mens rea, lacking moral blameworthiness, these being side effects of socially useful and socially necessary activity, in fact, not only could apply to so-called powerless offenders, the kinds of people who end up in strange ways, for example, not only could apply, but in fact, it was more legitimate to apply to those people because the crimes of corporations, the crimes of the powerful, were much more serious sources of social harm than the activities of those suspects who tended generally to get caught up in the criminal justice system and end up in places like strange ways. So that's a kind of background to what I want to say. And I now just want to kind of refer more specifically to the state of health and safety crimes and, and the, the consequences of those in the UK at present. So there are various indications as to the amounts of people who get killed as a result of work every year in the UK. The official data from HSE calculates every year about 14,000 deaths caused by working. 14,000 deaths year in and year out, right? of people, caused, uh, people made ill, fatally, or, or experiencing fatal injuries at work or by work. Other estimates, the International Labour Organization for the UK places that at about 37,000. The Hazards Movement places that at about 50,000. Nevertheless, 14,000, 37,000, 50,000, we're talking about an awful lot of dead bodies, which by the way, puts the numbers of homicides in any one year in the UK, uh, they pay into comparison, of course. Now, we know that the vast majority, based on research, not based upon what the HSE prosecutes, we know that based on research, the vast majority of those deaths are likely to be used to involve breaches of the law on the part of private profit-making corporations. We also know, and this is based upon HSE activity, that the vast majority of those deaths don't, deaths don't end up anywhere near the criminal justice system, anywhere near it, right? Firstly, they're not, they're not recorded accurately. Remember, HSE 14,000, 37,000 for the ILO, 50,000 for the for hazards movement. That's a big difference. Those deaths are not recorded accurately. Even if they're recorded, even those recorded by the HSE, the overwhelming majority of those 14,000 are, ne are never investigated. Uh, HSE barely, barely touches, in fact, doesn't, almost never touches, including during this pandemic, by the way, deaths caused by occupational illness. So a very, very small subset of those deaths are investigated. If they, if they are investigated or where they are investigated, no informal, no formal enforcement actions tend to follow. If there is prosecution which follows and it leads to conviction, the overwhelming sanction that results as a result of that conviction is a fine. And the overwhelming object of the fine is the corporate entity itself, not the individuals who own, control and benefit from the activities of the corporate entity. So individuals, powerful individuals, are protected in the small instance of prosecutions while corporations, companies pay fines. Now I want to back that up by, by just referring or support that by referring to some other data, this generated by my colleague Dave White more recently and myself. Uh, and the data uh, is FOI data. Um, and we were basically kind of digging around HSC responses to deaths over a 20 year period. It's not, it's for different purposes than today, right? And we're looking at HSC prosecutions following deaths, or we look at HSC responses, I'm going to wet prosecutions. HSC responses to deaths between 1999 to 2019, a 20 year period, right? Now bear in mind on HSC data, 14,000 deaths a year, over that 20 year period, there were, on there were about, on average, 280,000 deaths in total, 280,000 deaths in total. During that period, there were 4,809 prosecutions taken by HSE, all following fatal injuries at work. As I said, they tend not to take uh, touch fatal occupational illness. Of those 4,809 prosecutions taken by HSE, four in five of them were against companies and corporate bodies. About one in five were against individuals, including, by the way, the self-employed. So very, very powerless individuals, in fact, were, are getting caught up in this prosecu prosecutorial system designed to respond to crimes of the powerful. These just under, these 4,800 prosecutions resulted in 3,850 convictions, and of those, 3,000 just under led to fines being issued, and there were 100 custodial sentences that followed those convictions. So we've got 280,000 deaths, <laughs> 4,800 prosecutions, and 100 individuals end up getting banged up, right? So if we take the, the kind of 100, 100 prison sentences, in relation to the 4,800 prosecutions, forget the 280,000 deaths, right? 
That means that a conviction following a workplace death is likely to see a responsible individual end up in prison in about 2.5% of cases. 2.5% yeah? of the 4,800, not the 280,000. The point of all that and those numbers, the, the precise numbers perhaps aren't important, but the point of it is to say that in an empirical sense, in the context of safety crimes, and I would argue corporate crimes more generally, prison is pretty much out of the equation in terms of responding to the crimes and harms of the powerful. Prison is, in that context, an irrelevant. So, in conclusion, what does this mean? It means that for the powerful, for powerful individuals and corporate entities, we need to think about much more creative responses and answer the question, how do we punish? Prison isn't going to be used, right? What are alternative ways of punishing powerful offenders which do not require imprisonment? That's one thing, that's one kind of set of questions it generates. Secondly, though, we might take seriously the claim made about, made about the powerful who are guilty of crime, that they remain socially useful individuals and entities, and then apply that to all offenders. In other words, we might say that relatively powerless offenders who do end up in prison are at the same time, nevertheless, still socially useful individuals who carry out socially useful functions and that their crimes were also just a marginal side effect of their being and their acting. If we take that then, together with the points I made earlier, so we can then ask for all offenders, what's the point of punishment? Yeah. How do we best determine accountability for harm that's perpetrated by individuals and organisations? How do we best achieve social protection for citizens and societies from all forms of offending by the powerless and the powerful? So the point I'm making is any questions that we're engaged in today and over this week, I'm not certainly not uh, uh, undermining the points that have been made. In fact, in many respects, what I have to say perfectly supports what's been said, not least today. But any questions about who gets criminalised has to be accompanied by questions about who and what does not get criminalized. And the different groups, those criminalized and those not criminalized, are exactly the same now as they were 30 years ago, right? Who is now and who is not in strange ways is similarly different, similarly differentially distributed now as it was in 1990. No, there's no doubt about that. So the key point, as I indicated with those opening quotations from Stuart Hall and colleagues and from Colin Sumner, is that any consideration of crime, of criminal justice, of punishment and of the prison can only be held in the context of thinking about both the crimes perpetrated by, perpetrated by the relatively powerless and the crimes and harms which are generated by the relatively powerful. That's all I want to say. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Steve. Um, that, that, was really, uh, that was really interesting and it's uh, there's a question here from um, Elizabeth Cameron, which I think is very, um, well, of course, it's relevant to uh, what you've just said. And now it's just disappeared off my screen because I think maybe someone's upvoted it. Um, so where has it gone? Um, it's um, maybe someone's answered it. Oh, this is a bit embarrassing. Um, I think what, what um, right, where is it? Here we go. Um, I would argue, Steve, that the crimes of the powerful are often the cause of many of the crimes committed, increasing poverty, lack of housing, contributing to unemployment, etc. What would you say to this and where would Grenfell fall into this? Yeah, look, thank you. I, I agree. It's not, so it's, I agree. The link's stronger. It's not just that we need to consider these crimes. So whenever we talk about crime and the use of suspects, we need to think about the, 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 the kind of less obvious suspects. Um, in a sense, for equity, but also I completely take the point. Actually, it's it's the modus operandi of power. It's the processes the processes of power, the institutions of power, the individuals of power, who put the powerless in conditions and situations uh, where crime and criminalisation becomes almost an inevitable. It's an inevitable part of the distribution of power relations, which was part of the point of the two quotations that were made at, at the very beginning. So I I absolutely agree with that. Um, you know, and it, and it's, it, to me, it's perfectly clear uh, that, you know, as the, as the residents of Grenfell predict, predicted before the fire itself, I mean, seven months, that infamous blog by the Grenfell Action Group, KCTMO, the Tennis Management Organisation, playing with fire, where they predicted uh, that only a high consequence, high fatality tragedy would get their concerns about safety in the tower. But listen to, in other words, they knew they'd been put in positions by the powerful over a long period of time when ultimately some of them would end up with, and inevitably end up with an unnecessarily short life, a death. Yeah, so I, I agree completely with both of those kind of, uh, both those observations made in that question. Thanks for that. 
Thank you very much, Steve. Okay, uh, if I could invite our our other speakers back, and we'll have a uh, we'll have a quick panel discussion. Uh, we're, we're we're fast running out of time because everyone had so many really interesting things to say. Um, and while everyone's joining us, uh, Gloria, if, if I don't put you on the spot, maybe you would like to start us off. There's a question here about whether it, whether it's whether you think it's possible or realistic to think we might be able to get rid of the joint enterprise laws altogether. Do you think that's a kind of a realistic, indeed a desirable, but certainly a realistic possibility? Um, it's, uh, it's definitely possible. I did um, speak to a leading QC of uh, Garden Court and he said, you know, there's a lot of my colleagues here that wouldn't agree with getting rid of joint enterprise. And that would be, and, and it kind of partly it ties into, I mean, I, I live, Grenfell's there, by the way, I can see Grenfell from here. So, you know, the, the, the question of using joint enterprise on, on the people that are responsible for that fire, it's, it's really complicated for me because I want to get rid of joint enterprise. I don't want, I don't think in a, in a just society you should have something, because it's fascism, that's what it is. It's just fascism. It's a way of locking up groups. It's not about gangs, it's about families. We've got fathers, we've got father and son, we've got mum and two sons, we've got lots of brothers. So for, for justice, you know, it has to go, it has to go, yes. I, and uh, it, it, the thing is, if you have an individual in court that's up on a charge of murder, you have to prove with DNA, with evidence, that what that person's done. But with a joint enterprise charge, joint enterprise murder, you don't have to say what each individual's done. You can just say, well, he must have known what he was going to do because they spoke earlier in the day. And I went to a court, a joint enterprise trial once, and the judge said, oh, they speak to each other more than they speak to their fathers. They were teenagers. Do you know? So, yeah, it has to go. It, it, it's not fit for purpose in, in any justice system. And, and other, other societies, other countries don't have joint enterprise. So I'm sure we could we could get by without it as well. And, and do you see that as a, as a realistic possibility? I mean, maybe a long run. Well, I think all the things that the panellists have talked about today, about how unjust our society is, the fact that we look up children. I, I, I actually was really, get, I was getting really angry when Caroline was, because I know a lot of the stuff that Caroline was talking about. And I've just, because I've been doing this for so long, you kind of bank it and you just think, oh, well, there's nothing you can do about it. And that's part of the problem with our society, besides the shit media we've got. But it is part of the problem that we just accept the crap that we're dealt. And we think it's normal and it's not normal. It's not normal to lock 13 year old children up. It's not, that's wrong. It's just, and children who haven't actually done anything in our remand system, you put in a child in remand because you think they're gonna get found guilty of a crime they haven't even gone to court for. And that means they miss out school, they miss out their friends, they lose their family. They, you know, our remand system's nuts. The whole system's nuts and, and we accept it. We're a society that accepts these absolutely abhorrent things that are dealt to us, the racism, the, everything, and we just accept it. And it, I don't know, I didn't expect to get angry today, but Caroline definitely triggered something in me thinking, why am I not angrier? Why are we not angry that this is going on? You know, why? Because we, I mean, we all accept it in a way, but... The only thing we can do to change it is demand change. The only that that's why strange way has happened. They demanded change. They made it happen because it was so abhorrent in there. They got up on the roof and they demanded it. And you know the, the various riots that we've had. We've got the anniversary of all the riots coming up. 2011 riots, which by the way, Mr. Keir Starmer wanted to keep the courts open 24 hours a day to lock up young boys who were stealing bottles of water. And I went to some of the riots trials and they were joint enterprise, violent disorder, joint enterprise afraid. That is a way of locking up groups and it must stop. It has to stop. And I hope, I hope it stops in my lifetime, but I don't know. I'm not hopeful because we're not angry enough. We're as a society, we're just complacent. It's like John said, we're frightened. We're going to take our tellies away. If they take our, you know, take our goodies away, we, we're, you know, and that's, the thing about people not being angry it's like it doesn't ha it won't happen to me if i keep my head down it'll happen over there and until it affects you until you have a loved one that goes to prison for something they haven't done we're not angry enough thank you thank you gloria 
Uh, and it relates to another question that's uh, that's directed at Gloria, you and and John. But I think there's a kind of a broader um, context there as well, and very much in relation to what you've just been saying, which is about greater accountability of the criminal justice system, whether that's whether that's possible, um, and how it might be achieved beyond important legal challenges. And I'm just wondering whether um, any of our other panelists, Steve, Caroline, Patrick, John, whether you might want to offer any thoughts on that, maybe building on what Gloria's just been saying. Maybe not. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll come in, um, if, if I may, Richard, yeah. Um, Gloria, um, completely take what you've said. For me, I'm permanently angry, permanently upset, um, but I, I contain, manage, and strategize the anger and upset. And I think that's what we have to do. Um, we, with Center for Crime and Justice Studies for Children, uh, we set up an end child imprisonment campaign. If you go to our website, Article 39, it's on the front page. I believe we're the first nation to, where NGOs, non-governmental organizations have come together to demand that child prisons close. I think what is central to such a strategy is to be honest and tell the truth about what's happening and what's being done to children and also to present not an alternative to, to prison but to present back what we know to be true about um, treating children well uh, John, you, you very modestly said, had you not been kicked out of school at 13, things may have been different for you. Um, I would go even further. I think that your life would have been really different. Had at 13, you been included rather than excluded. And we know how to do this as human beings. We know how to include children, to make children feel loved and, and part of things and that they belong and that, as Patrick said, they're not outsiders or others. Um, anyway, I, I'm the anger and the upset um, is, is coming. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, we just need, we, we need to push for the closure of these institutions and work together to achieve that goal. John, oh, did you... Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, just quick on the accountability thing. Uh, for me, quintessentially, um, our judiciary can say they've mistakenly misinterpreted the law for 32 years and then have no accountability for it by allowing no appeals. Just baffles me. They sit on the benches telling us all how to live and to be accountable for our offences, but they don't do it themselves. Uh, and just quickly, I think it's really telling. I, when I went to Strange Ways at 15, I was there for six weeks and then I went to um, Watton Detention Centre. And I would have preferred to be in Strange Ways. That was like a YP thing, but it just got battered as soon as we went in the door. It was just horrendous. I think that's very telling. Um, yeah, so, like, can I say anything? Just need to get them at school. And it's not hard, it doesn't cost a lot of money. Yeah, it's just nuts. You've got me going now. <laughs> Thank Can you. I just add to Richard as well? Um, yeah. I guess it's more a question as well, and I'm looking at Steve here. But there's something about, and picking up on Caroline's point, there's something about the idea of including looking after young people but there's tension there isn't there because that sense of inclusion has always required individuals who are excluded we define ourselves by inclusion by looking at well who doesn't belong and there's always something there that is a tension and is a challenge um so i'd like to think through some of that although i don't think we've got time today to do that but i think more important in terms of questions of accountability um 
there have been too many injustices for me to believe that we can almost weave in some notion of accountability into a system that, frankly, is doing what it's supposed to be doing and what it's designed to be doing. Um, there's real challenges in the idea of trying to find accountability in the legal system that can kill citizens, members of society, kill individuals, people who've lost their lives at the hands of the police or within these institutions. And then somehow we want to appeal to the same apparatus to try and deliver justice. There's something hugely problematic or challenging in even thinking through some of that. I guess it needs to be something very different than something more radical in terms of how we respond to these concerns. I think you're absolutely right, Caroline. There shouldn't be children in prisons. It's as simple as that. And I guess the anger is probably spreading, but I've always been an angry character and an angry individual. But essentially there's something about there's no... I don't believe in my heart that we can build accountability into a system that is premised on injustice from the outset. Steve, would you, do you have any final reflections? I mean, it's... Well, I mean, yeah, actually, Patrick's really said what I wanted to say in a different way. I was going to use Grenfell as an example. I won't because we're running out of time, but I, I just want to say that, you know, actually we shouldn't expect the criminal justice system to deliver accountability because that's not what it's designed to do. Um, you know, we need democratisation and, and that's a massive challenge, but actually it is the challenge. Let's not look to the law, let's not look to the state. Um, uh, you know, if we, if we want justice and democratic accountability, we need, we need to democratise the structures and institutions within which we, we, within, within, within which we live. Yep. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, We've run out of time and I'm really sorry about that because I think we could be talking for quite a bit longer and, you know, that kind of sense of anger, um, it is quite emotional because when we're talking about a set of institutions that are the cause and source of so much pain and suffering, it's, it's difficult not to get angry about it and feel emotional about it and perhaps we shouldn't, you know, perhaps we just do need, as Gloria says, maybe we need to be a lot more angry about that and and rediscover that anger thinking forward. Now, tomorrow we're going to, in our final webinar, we're going to be trying to kind of look forward really and think about from the context of what feels like a 200 year failed prison experiment, what might the future be? Is it possible to imagine a future without prisons? Imagine a future where we don't have these kinds of painful and harm creating institutions? Or are we forever destined to just repeat what's gone before? I hope the answer is very much it is possible to, to look forward and to think about new ways of doing things. And I think we've started to chart some options and thoughts in the session today. So it, it simply leaves me to, to thank all our speakers, uh, Steve, Gloria, Caroline, John, Patrick. You've all been absolutely fantastic and some wonderful observations and challenges and also to our, all our participants today and all our attendees. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all your questions. There just wasn't enough time for all of them. So thank you very much. And um, I look forward to seeing many of you tomorrow.